I am the former I am the former CEO of Axiom Technologies, which is a last mile broadband provider. Um, and I stepped down from that role in 2018 to um, spearhead the creation of the National Digital Equity Center, which has a goal of closing the digital divide here in Maine and across the United States. Um, for disclosure, I am on the board of the Connect Maine Authority, of which some of you have applied for funding, for planning grants, or will apply for infrastructure grants. Um, and I was on the governor's economic recovery committee and chaired the infrastructure committee. And it was that, that committee that did um, that provided all of the recommendations to the governor um, for broadband, um, digital equity and digital inclusion. Um, we have raised about $5 million to provide free digital literacy classes, um, devices for, income, for folks that are, meet the income eligibility guidelines for Maine and its people. So today we're gonna to talk about the work that we do at the digital, National Digital Equity Center and how you might want to um, join us to help us close that digital divide. And I'm gonna share screen. All right, you all can see that. Okay, let me put you over here. All right. So what is digital equity and digital inclusion? So we know that digital equity is a condition in which all individuals and communities have the information technology capacity to participate in our society, democracy, and economy. When the pandemic hit, we saw how deep the digital divide was in the state. Um, we had students who couldn't connect to be, um, remote classrooms. We had um, um, employees who couldn't participate in as a remote worker because they didn't either didn't have an internet connection or they couldn't um, because it wasn't available to them or they couldn't afford it or they didn't have the equipment to participate. And then the, the group that I lost the most sleep over were our older adults who all of it, you know, were already battling isolation and loneliness. And now we have a shelter in place um, uh, directive, which, and for those that were not, that did not use technology, they were then cut off even further from their family and their loved ones. Um, digital equity is necessary for civic and cultural participation, employment, lifelong learning, and access to essential services. Um, we achieve digital equity by promoting digital inclusion, which, which include affordable broadband, affordable equipment, digital literacy training, and public computer access. The National Digital Equity Center writes digital equity and digital inclusion plans for communities. We include plans for how do you, do, how do you um, achieve affordable broadband equipment? Uh, how do you promote digital literacy? Um, where are the places that there's public computer access? Are there community advocates such as yourselves that can help promote digital um, equity and digital inclusion in your communities? And then um, broadband adoption. And we'll talk about that one in just a few minutes. When you, are, when you are looking at your community and you're considering bringing in broadband, building network, contracting with providers, whatever, whatever path you're gonna go, the question you have to have is, is there a plan for um, affordable broadband for low to moderate income families that cannot afford an internet connection? There needs to be a plan on um, to identify community members that need equipment, laptops, desktops, tablets, et cetera. Do you, does your community um, have the digital skills to participate in our digital economy. And this just talks about um, um, the variety of technical skills. And we need, we need um, uh, those skills to, um, to, to participate in work in different work assignments that you might have, or to do a telehealth visit with your provider, or again, connecting with family and friends and, um, uh, around the globe. We do a lot of surveys with communities and not surprising, the, um, the most response we have on classes that uh, local communities might like to take, and this is, an, this is an aggregate among all of the surveys that we did, 94% of our students want to learn how to do video streaming, how to get rid of your cable network or your dish network and um, participate, um, subscribe to some of those video um, streaming channels. 
you know, I, I, you know, I, it, we're used to using a remote control. What happens when that remote control is not there? What's a smart TV and all those apps that are available on the smart TV? And second um, in line are all the workforce development um, uh, skills, Microsoft Word, Excel, QuickBooks, um, and then basic knowledge of computer, internet safety, connecting with family and friends. And not surprising, using social media is not one of our most popular classes because people can figure it out once they're online pretty much for themselves. Um, is there public Wi-Fi? Are there places like libraries and adult education lo locations that have computers available for public use? Um, in Washington County, we have the Accent Education and Training Center, Washington County Adult Ed. People can go in there. There are like computers for folks to use. And we're really lucky in this state because all of our libraries belong to the main state, um, main school and library network. They all have a hundred meg symmetrical connection. And many of those libraries have one or two or more computers available for public use. Are there community volunteers that can promote digital inclusion efforts? We have a lot of um, communities right now that are promoting the affordable connectivity program, which is the FCC program for discounted broadband. Those local community members and advocates are helping other community members to, uh, to know that that is a, um, a service that's out there um, for folks to get discounted broadband. And then what's the community's take rate? Do all of the homes have a computer? So we do a, um, when we're doing digital equity and digital inclusion plans, we do a deep dive into the demographics of, of the, the communities that we're working with. And that includes understanding the demographics of the, of the um, community members, as well as broadband adoption. Um, which is a survey that the American Community Survey, US Census does um, periodically for folks. Um, Elaine, um, let me know most of the communities that would be on this call. And so I did a, a little bit of an analysis for, for those of you that are here today. Um, and so these statistics are from um, 2018. We're waiting for the 2020 statistics to be released sometime in early March. Um, and so we, we, how many households are there in a community? How many of those households have a computer? How many have a broadband connection? What's the average family median income? What, what's the percentage of the, the um, community members in that community that ha, are, have income below the federal poverty guidelines? You need to see, keep a couple of things in mind when you look at this. And one is, is that this does not include any of the seasonal people who we know come to visit. And so when we're talking households, we're only talking about those homes that actually register as um, homes in your community. It does not include um, on, on the census, any of your seasonal visitors. Um, the broadband connection, keep that in mind. It doesn't mean it's a good broadband connection. It may just be a three over one or a seven over one connection. So keep that in mind when you look at these statistics and as you, as you um, continue down your path to bring better, better broadband to your community. The National Digital Equity Center provides those digital equity and digital inclusion plans. We have three curricula that we um, provide. All classes are free and people can take as many classes as they wish. So I want to take away that today um, for this, this presentation. The, the classes are broken into three different curricula. For work and business, that includes all of the Microsoft classes, Microsoft Word, Excel, Publisher, um, PowerPoint, QuickBooks for small business, um, website development for small business, um, for home and education. At the onset of the, of the pandemic, we did a lot of classes for teachers to learn how to use the Google tools, Google Classroom, Google Meet, as well as for parents to understand the platform that, there's, that their kiddos were connecting to their, their teachers. Um, internet safety, internet safety for parents and grandparents of teens and tweens, because those kiddos know more than we do. Um, and we need to stay one step ahead of them. Um, there are classes, if you're considering putting uh, a fiber connection in your connect community, 
We have classes on how to cut the cord. How do, you, how do you get rid of your satellite or your dish network? And how do you use those video streaming? And there's so many different services that are out there and different prices, of course. Um, for the, the, the final is aging well with technology. So prior to the pandemic, we had, we, we had a, an ad hoc group of older adult experts around the state. AARP, UMaine Center on Aging, New England Telehealth Resource Center, um, the Maine Council on Aging, and several others. And we designed a curricula for folks that were 55 and older. It includes those classes like connecting, video conferencing with family and friends, with healthcare providers, um, how to protect your online presence and create a safe, a, a good password. Um, how to identify fake news, um, um, all of the things that can make our older adults who are going on online for the first time vulnerable, and we want to make sure they have all of those skills and knowledge to protect themselves when they're online. There are, there's classes on monitoring your health care, monitoring your blood pressure, your um, uh, weight, your exercise, etc., um, and again, all of those internet safety classes that are available um, for, for folks. That said, anyone can take any class. It does not matter what age you are. Um, you're, anyone is welcome to take as many classes as they wish. Prior to the pandemic, we held the classes in public places, in our local libraries, adult education programs, older adult organization, community centers, anywhere we could have a public um, gathering of people. When the pandemic happened, those places were closed. And so our instructors did a great job of moving those classes to an online interactive platform. Um, the class sizes are small. There's usually no more than 10. Students can stay connected to the instructor after the class to do follow-up questions if they forgot something or need better clarification. Um, the problem with that model was that I felt what we were making the digital divide deeper here in our state that there were the, the people who came to those in-person classes tended to be novice computer users, beginners, and just learning for the first time. And so we, with a, um, we received a, a bit of funding from one of our foundations and um, started a pilot program and bought 100 tablets that had cell connectivity. And we said, which were, well, it was not nearly enough for the, everyone who needed a connection or a device across the state. So we said, if you're 70 and older, you don't have any equipment or you don't have an internet connection, we will give you this device free um, and assign a tutor to you to teach you how to learn it. Um, the devices were mailed to the tablet recipients. They went out fully loaded with all of the applications on them, including Zoom um, and a link to that instructor. The first digital literacy session was typically over the phone in teaching someone how to find the on and off button on a device, that little tiny little knob that's on the side. Um, and the, the end game of that first session was to get the student to click on the Zoom link and, become, and come face to face with the instructor for the first time. You can just imagine the pure joy when that happens, when people are, are seeing vi someone via video conference that they've never been, in, um, been exposed to that before. And the instructor would work with that student um, uh, enough to get them to the point where they could join any one of those classes. The program was wildly successful and it spurred a lot of relationships with multiple um, organizations across the state. Um, healthcare organizations, mental health facilities, um, uh, libraries, adult eds, uh, older adult organizations. And those organizations raised funds to purchase devices for the people that they were serving and worked with us at the National Digital Equity Center to help provision the devices, get them into the hands of the people they wanted to send those devices to. And, and we at the, at the National Digital Equity Center provided all of the tutoring and classes and support so they could learn how to use that device. Um, the state of Maine's um, Office of Community Development then stepped in and said, we have some funding for you to provide devices to folks that are low to moderate income, no, no age um, limit on them. Um, and so we've been, we expended one, one um, uh, pot of funds, we're on our second one with the Office of Community Development 
uh, folks can apply if they meet the income eligibility guidelines. If they have an internet connection, we will give them a refurbished laptop or refurbished desktop. They have to take five hours of class instruction, including internet safety, and then we will issue a certificate of ownership. They may keep the device. The tablet, we also require them to take some classes, including internet safety, um, because the device, we have to pay the um, uh, cell company for the recurring cost on the internet connectivity. We don't give them, but they may keep them for one or two years, depending on the program that they're in. Um, we have a partner affiliate program. So once people started coming into physical space, when libraries opened and senior centers opened, we then began a program called the partner affiliate on-site program. So organizations, it could be a town office, it could be a library, it could be a community center. They would bring together a group of people, they would facilitate the class and we bring in our instructor over Zoom. Um, and so we have many hands across the state helping us close that digital divide by hosting those classes. Um, we have an online portal, the partner can go in and choose the classes they wanna hold on site. They can register students, they can request devices. Um, we do a lot of training around that so that people are comfortable in, um, in, in the, the, uh, online, um, on the online portal for all of our partners. And then we have a volunteer program. We have trained over 70 folks around the state to provide one-on-one -on -one tutoring to some of the people that they're serving. Might be someone at a local library or um, a senior center. And so we're always, um, always bringing new volunteers online. It's a lot of stuff we do. Um, and some, for some organizations, they will do one or the other or all. It just depends on what's, uh, what, what's the, the best thing for your organization. We love statistics, right? And so all of our services are free for Maine residents. Um, but I also like to say free is not free. Free means you must register on our, um, um, our, on our, our registration, um, enrollment registration. And we ask questions um, that um, can sometimes be a hard question to ask. Um, all of the information we, we, we gather goes behind a very secure firewall. We only get the aggregate data, so I can do reports like this, that 67% of our students are 50 years and older, 27, 70%, and my favorite, favorite, favorite is 8% of our students are 80 years old and older. 41% um, of our students have a high school diploma or less, 20X actually gone up, 30% of our students are unemployed, 34% are retired, 48% of our students have a family median income of 34.9 or less. These statistics tell me that we are reaching some of Maine's most vulnerable populations. Because we're funded, we have our funding comes from the federal government, the state government, private philanthropy. We have to measure outcomes. Um, and we are, does digital literacy um, increase workforce skills? Does it, uh, does it um, mean that a uh, a family medium income might increase that based on those skills assessment. Um, does, it, does it increase access to educational attainment? If you take a class on, online with us, does it mean that you are comfortable to take a class online with one of the post-secondary institutions? Um, and, and aging in place, can older adults remain in their homes longer if they use, the, if they use technology? Does it reduce isolation and loneliness? Um, does it improve healthcare outcomes? Um, telehealth increase in the first year of the pandemic, the telehealth um, visits increased 13,000% across the country, which is an amazing, amazing number. Um, I have a, an aunt, she turns 100 years old next um, Sunday. We got her on Facebook when she was in her 70s. She's an active Facebook user. She's on looking at all of the pictures and posts from a very, very big family, her, her grandchildren, her, her great-grandchildren. And when the pandemic hit, she was used to a lot of visitors, people in and out of her house, and she couldn't do that anymore. And so she started going online. She was doing FaceTime and reading stories to her great-great-grandchildren. I believe that if people want to learn, they can. And so 
Um, I don't think age has any limits in, the, in, in, in learning new skills. It's the desire, I believe, more than anything. You can reach me at any time. I'm going to put my own, um, uh, I will put my contact information in the chat. Um, I, this is what I do all day, every day. So happy to talk to any of you um, or your communities, present to your communities. And I am very happy to take any questions that you might have, because I just threw an awful lot of information out at all of you. I have a question, <clears throat> uh, Susan. How many do you, since you love statistics and numbers so much, how many devices has NDEC, the National Digital Equity Center, sent out to people? Do you know, or a rough? How many people? Have I think we're out? approaching eight or nine hundred. We're now getting about fifty requests per week. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, and then there are all of the devices that were purchased by partner organizations. So for instance, they might, um, we did a project with the um, uh, Southern Maine area on aging, they purchased device and they would put the um, devices in the hands of their volunteers or the people they were serving. So there, there's that whole group of, of um, devices that are out there. Thank you. And so Susan uh, dropped in the chat her uh, work email for all of you. Um, I'm assuming somebody must have. Rob, did you have a question for Susan? Yeah, yeah. And I just wanted to say that was a terrific presentation. And um, I'm just so, um, I'm really happy to know there's, there's all this going on. I mean, it's really terrific. It, I have just a nerdy question. I never heard three over one, seven over one expression as a, broadband capacity thing. What Can you explain what that is? I, it's not terribly important, I know, but I'm just curious. So in the broadband world, um, there's upload and download speeds. Download speeds tend to be higher than upload speeds. Yes. So when you're looking at, at, pro, at building broadband in your community, the speed matters. So in a fiber connection, it's there's two terms asymmetrical and symmetrical. Asymmetrical means that the upload and download speeds are not the same. Symmetrical means that they are the same. So go to, back to the libraries. The libraries have a symmetrical connection. That means that it, you, have, you can upload. And when we think about that, back years ago, it didn't matter, right? Because it was businesses that might need that upload speeds. But when you think about what your use of technology is, every time you take a picture and you save it. It's saving to the cloud. You're uploading that picture. So we're using, as consumers, we are using much more upload than we have ever done before. And it's only yeah. going to get more as more software apps come out or technology, um, you know, all of those, all of the things that we're, we're becoming, are becoming more a, a, of our everyday lives. Yeah. And as we're doing more video conferencing and uh, well, and as the speed of the network gets faster and there's more and more capability to do more and more interesting things. Exactly, exactly. So, okay, so, so three over one, seven over one is a, a ratio of download to upload. Right, so seven, seven megs down, one meg up, three okay. megs down, one meg up. Or All symmetrical those... is, is you've got e equal capacity up and down. Correct. Yeah. And Correct. all the libraries have a hundred meg symmetrical ring. Wow. At <laughs> least, and many of them even more as, yeah. as the main school and library network has built out um, their connections. Most of their connections are fiber connections now. Wow, that's great. Well, thank you, thank you. Boy, it's terrific. Well, thank you. Hey, Susan. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> nice to see you. Nice to see you. Um, are you in the warm place or the cold I am place? In beautiful Fort Myers. That's what I thought. I'm a little <laughs> jealous today. Anyways, um, uh, I have a question that's a little further down the, the pathway here. What, what should be, as we're reviewing um, provider proposals to towns or to regions, um, 
what should be our expectation of how providers uh, show up and talk about and propose um, ideas about digital equity and inclusion in our towns and regions? So we work with a lot of towns and have um, we work with the Island Institute, some, some of the consultant mission broadband, um, uh, Axiom, several of the others. And for some of the projects that are going on at the onset, they're bringing in a digital equity and digital inclusion plan. So let me talk about the town of Sears Port. Um, they, they did a broadband, um, community broadband plan. They've decided they wanna do a fiber to the home. They also asked for a digital equity and digital inclusion plan. And they, in that plan, we talked about ways to um, increase um, uh, afford, what, that we talked about the need to address affordable broadband. And the reason for that was 25% of the homes in Searsport had a family median income of 25K or less. That means if they're building a fiber to the home project and typically fiber 60, 70 or so dollars per month, they were gonna make the digital divide deeper because those low income families might not be able to afford that price every month. And so they needed to have an affordable um, pl broadband plan. They also wanted to educate their um, their, their, their community members. And, you know, when I, when you talk about, we talk about broadband, broadband is the how, how are we going to get everybody connected? Digital inclusion is the why, why is it important? Well, it's important for a healthcare visit. It's important um, to be a remote worker. It's important to join meetings like this, if you have a good broadband connection. And so, the community, the library, and the town office, both are partners, are one of our on-site class partners, and both are holding classes at, in Searsport. They haven't even built, they're not building the network yet, right? They've got to figure out the funding and all the rest of it, but they're promoting, they're promoting the affordable connectivity program because they know that there are people who will, are qualified for that. Um, they came to me um, a couple months ago after we wrote the, the plan and they said, how are we going to know what 25% of those homes are low income? How will we know who needs us? And so that's when we suggested that they start doing the affordable connectivity program classes at their town office, promote it as a benefit, not that, you know, the, it, because who doesn't like a discount? Right, and so you, you promote it in the positive, right? Did you know that you could get this discount? You should come to this class and find out if you're eligible. That's a different message than let's figure out who might, who, who's poor in our community, right? Because that's confidential information. No one's gonna know, right? And so the town worked with the, the town office and the library are working in there. They're, 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 they both are doing classes and they're, they're, they're providing this, they're promoting this in their community. They're getting ready when they have to, when before the fiber connection comes in, they're trying to bring, to educate their community of what they can do with broadband, how they can increase their, um, their skill levels all before that fiber connection comes in. And then, and so when, because take rate matters, right? So let's flip it, let's flip it a little bit. If you're a broadband provider, the number of people who sign up for your network matters. It's how you meet your return on investment. If you build a network and only 20% of the, the homes subscribe to it, you're probably going to be in trouble right? Because you have to make enough money in order to pay back whatever debt um, there is or the maintenance of it that you're going to need to make enough. You're going to have to have enough people subscribing. And so when you can get people engaged in understanding the why, why is this important? Then take rate starts to climb. 
people understand the value of, the, of, of what that network will mean to that community. And so if you can, in, if, if we can increase tape rate by 10% or 20%, that's the difference of, of that network being successful and meeting it and, and meeting that return on investment and possibly to continue building out that network or increasing the capacity of that network. Um, the, the more people you have on the network, the better financial model that you have in, 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 in um, delivering service. Jean, I saw your hand is up. Thanks, Susan. That was great. You're welcome. Hi, there. Susan. We spoke earlier um, a couple <laughs> months ago about the need here in eSport to do education if we want to get broadband because our population does pretty much skew elderly. And um, so education needs to happen. But a question that I have, um, yeah, do, you do providers have rates uh, for people yeah. who are seasonal? Because I'm thinking for us to get a good population signed up, we're going to have to sign up our seasonal uh, users as well. Is, is there an opportunity for that in broadband companies? So it's going to depend on the provider. It's going to depend on the financial model. Um, I'd refer you to Rope Bluffs and ask, to ask them right. about, um, ask them what they're doing for their seasonal. There's a rate for seasonal. They have to, pro, they have to sign up for so many months in order to, um, to join the network because it's not gonna work on seasonal, your seasonal residents to say, oh, I'm only there for the month of July, so I'm only gonna pay you for a month. You gotta pay for that network mm -hmm. going forward and you're gonna need to have as many people sign up for it as you can. Um, every community is going to be different and, and working with your providers, it might be different, but I would, but I think Rope, Rope Bless had a good model. Um, and I don't know, Elaine, do you, or, or Crystal, do you remember, I, I want to say it's like an eight month or 10 months or something that they have to pay for. I'm not sure. Okay. I don't know. Okay. I don't know why they're so uh, <laughs> Elaine or Crystal send me uh, Lisa Hanscom's contact information and I'll, I'll, I'll get a hold of her. I'll do that, Jenny. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Susan. Thanks, Jean. So I have another question. If, um, if we've got um, quite a few communities here, and so if a community wanted to get started um, with the uh, digital, with the classes, they could reach out to you and see if the local libraries to partner with local libraries <clears throat> or town offices uh, to get these classes or, um, you know, on location or something like that. Yeah, so I have, um, I sent Elaine a copy, a PDF of the PowerPoint. Um, and I sent her a document that is about the partner on-site classes, and I sent her a list of all the classes. So um, Elaine, I'm sure we'll send that out to all of you and it will be available as materials going forward. Uh, reach out at any point. Uh, my email is in here. If you're interested, shoot me an email. I, we can have a conversation about this and I can get you connected to all the right people within the National Digital Equity Center. To, st to, to start those classes on a local, to be a partner, to promote them, um, or just refer people, because you can do that too. On our website, um, we have, um, uh, let me just, let me pull that up, because I think that might be helpful for all of you. I'm gonna share screen again. Okay, so on our website, we have our main programs um, and for affordable devices. You can go in and, um, where do we go here? To request a device. Where am I going here? 
uh, you can send an email, you can give us a call. Um, there's a referral in here. I'm not, I think I'm missing it. Oh, there we are right here. I went too fast. Okay, so here anyone can, so organizations, we have a lot of um, organizations, healthcare centers, um, older adult organizations um, that will refer somebody to us. So you can come in here or you can send this link to anyone um, that might want a device. Um, they're just asking, you know, some basic information. We do say that if you are, um, if you are referring someone, make sure they know that we are going to call them from the National Digital Equity Center. So if, you, if you're referring somebody, just say someone's gonna reach out to you because we get these, these requests and then one of our admin people call that person directly to talk about um, the device. When we talk about, when we set somebody up with a device, we're also, we're also evaluating what their skill level might be and if they might need to have some individual attention to get them up and running on that particular device. So we, we spend a lot of time up front. We don't just put a device out there and say, oh, you're on your own. You need to figure it out on your own. We don't do that. So everyone gets personalized attention when they get at one of our devices. We have a question from Martha, but Martha, I wanna interject a question myself right here on this topic. Um, Susan, are there opportunities for municipalities who maybe want to transition over to um, remote meetings so that more people can get involved? Is there assistance to help them get the both the technology and the, um, the knowledge? And then yes. Martha, please jump in when we're finished. Yes, we do some Zoom classes and teaching organizations or individuals on learning how to use Zoom, how to... Um, uh, make sure that you, you don't get bombed, Zoom bombed, and you know unwanted people come onto your session, um, and how to record those do, those meetings so that they become public knowledge. You know, on our board meetings, um, our NDC board meetings, we do we record the meetings and they become part of the minutes so that we've got we can refer back to those Zoom sessions. So it's one of the the options that you all have as a community, and it's nice as a community to be able to offer. Those, those meetings for perhaps the, your seasonal people who are really interested, invested in your community or people who are homebound and would like to attend the meetings, but the weather's awful or they don't have transportation. So I think, you know, having those meetings online, it, 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 in, it, it enlarges um, the, it enlarges your scope of the people who are, who are, who will join those meetings if they can do them remotely. Thank Time you. for my question. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, I was interested, I'm in Lubeck and we're just kind of, it, it feels like early days. It is for me early days in looking at this broadband thing. Although I know people in town have been thinking about it, working on it for some time. Um, my question is, do you have any information um, on the extent to which you've already been involved, if any, in Lubeck as far as these classes and courses and, and handing out devices. Um, is there an awareness that you know of in my town for your services? Yes, we have a partner agreement with the Lubeck Community Outreach Center. And Wonderful, so, thank yeah, you. So they're, they're in the process, they've been trained. Um, they will be offering classes there. Um, Lubeck, we help them with a grant at, for Maine Community Foundation for equipment that they could keep at their location as well as to get um, better connectivity to do um, video conferencing. So um, Elodie was really good. She really, you know, she spent it's a lot wonderful. of time with us. So yeah, Lubeck is coming right along. Yay us! <laughs> Sandra, you have your hand raised. Hi. Hello, Susan. Good to see your face again. Hi, Sandra. Um, and thank you for hosting these um, informational sessions. Uh, I am out of, I'm actually in Hancock County, uh, but my question 
teeters on Martha's request as well, working with towns. Um, curious about suggestions on towns that really don't want to be part of the digital equity. And what is a better avenue um, when there's community volunteers and committees that want to be part of connectivity? Is it better to work with a library or a school or what have you found in other communities? Yeah, so some town offices are too little, right? They don't have space for to bring people in or they're, you know, they're really part time. They, you know, so it sometimes the town office is not the right um, uh, partner. Um, libraries are great partners. We've worked with many, many libraries across the state and libraries are great partners. And for many libraries, it means that they can offer additional services without using a lot of resources because a lot of libraries are all part-time. And uh, I also, my own personal feeling on libraries is that the more people that are engaged at libraries, the better option, the better it is that when it comes time for town meeting and they have to vote for budget, the more people who've been, who visited that library are likely going to approve a budget for them. And so if they can get in a whole other different group of people who don't normally go into the library with for digital literacy classes, that's, I think it's a win. Um, and then community centers, is there, or churches, um, if there's a church basement that there might be some um, uh, uh, um, interest, I mean, they have to have an internet connection. So that's an important piece right there, right? And a good enough internet connection to allow for that video conferencing session to go on. Um, older adult organizations, we work with a lot of age-friendly communities and, and, and will hold classes. Adult education, we work with all of the adult education in Washington and Hancock County. They all are holding classes. They're all, if you go up on our, on our website on on-site classes, you'll see a lot of those adult ed programs are already on, on board with us. Um, you know, any place that you can have a public gathering of people, that's sort of the, the criteria. And then who is going to be the point person? Who's going to help facilitate those classes? And then we'll provide the training. So it doesn't have to be one or the other. We also have communities where there are multiple places like Searsport, it's the town office and the library that are both um, partner organizations. So um, we're happy to work with um, any, any um, community um, organization, grassroots group of people, whatever it's gonna take to provide, um, to, to promote those classes and, 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 and public awareness. If there's not another question to follow up on a comment you just made, Susan, um, with regards to assistance, you mentioned partner affiliate on site and volunteers. Could you speak a little bit more about how that works? Sure. So the partner affiliate is the on site. So a community decides that they want to hold classes at their location. We're going to bring the instructor in over Zoom, and there's going to be a facilitator at that location to help those that are um, attending the class to participate in the class. That's one. Volunteers are community members that want, that have a, um, that, that want to help, right? And they might want to do, um, they may want to do some one-on-one -on -one tutoring. It's not unusual to see somebody um, from a library that is going to be available an hour a week to provide one-on-one -on -one assistance or an older adult organization that wants to help um, get somebody up online. Um, this I talked about the um, uh, uh, the southern um, uh, main age, age, aging agency on aging, and their volunteers when the pandemic hit, their volunteers couldn't go to their their clients' um, homes anymore, and so we trained the volunteers to provide. Um, uh, classes to the clients they were serving and, and got technology into their hands. So there's a lot of different ways um, that volunteers can help. Um, we have volunteers in our Southern main office that come in and help our staff provision, um, to provision and take some of the phone calls for people requesting tablets. So there's lots of different opportunities for folks to help us. Have you worked with the schools at all, Susan? I was just thinking about uh, youth engagement and seniors in high school have so many volunteer hours. It seems like their tech clubs might be a good match for that. 
there's a group down in Skowhegan that um, uh, their high school students volunteer to work in a downtown location and they have a tech hub. They provide um, uh, technology training to older adults um, at their location couple at two or three afternoons a week, people can just drop in. I think that for many of our, our youth, uh, you know, getting them into a volunteer role and helping the people in their community is a great idea. We've worked with 4-H clubs on this. Um, we have, I just um, heard from uh, Goodwill New England, they want, they have a, a group of, of students that are interested in taking classes and, and as well as, as helping others. So there's a, um, so you know, most of the people we see, we, we serve are 18 and older, but we are open to any group that might want to um, uh, do skill building with a, um, a, a, a teenagers and high school students would be perfectly fine. Thank you. What a fantastic, just to follow up on that, Susan, what a fantastic way to have intergenerational, um, it, you know, it just amazing, you know, just to have the the young and the the elder population working together. Um, and sometimes I know that as I get older, I think I know everything, and you know, we <laughs> and but our our young adults and our youth, they they're pretty tech savvy. But what an amazing way to combine generations like that. That's awesome. Yeah, there's some caution around us. We, all of our, everything has to be in public place, right? And so we don't allow anybody to go, even our instructors, they're not allowed to go to anyone's home. Um, all of our volunteers have a background check. Um, they have to sign a code of conduct and agree to our, you know, the rules of our organization. So there's, there's some, you know, we wanna make sure that it's a good experience for everyone. Um, the volunteers go through a lot of vigorous training before we sort of set them loose to, to provide service to um, uh, the people in their communities. So, you know, I think that the, the, the biggest thing is where is public space? That's the big one. You know, where are they, like in the library is great or at a senior center where there are other people around and they're not in a, um, a closed setting. I think that's, that's important for any volunteer and for the, and for the organization that's hosting that volunteer. You want to make sure that they're following their rules as well. Were there more questions for Susan? That's it. Everything's, she answered everything. Go ahead, Jeannie. Um, I, I just want to speak for the quality of the teachers that she has teaching the online classes. They that This has been one of my pandemic uh, go-tos. I've taken a lot of the classes and I've taken them more than once because I don't always get it the first time, but they are so patient and so good with people who, who just, um, are novices to com coming online. They're, they're very patient teachers. And I, I, I just wanna commend you, Susan, on, on the quality of your uh, digital teachers. They're great. Oh, thank you, Jean. You know, our instructors are geographically placed across- yeah, I'd like to also say that uh, Jerry's- Go ahead. I think there's just a little lag. Go ahead and finish your question. Nope. Okay. So all of our teachers are geographically placed across the state. Um, we, when we, when we've hired teachers that they've had um, experience working with adults and teaching them in one form or the other. Um, then really the number one criteria is their compassion for others, right? If they are compassionate, then we can teach them to teach others. Um, we were very lucky to have Elaine as a teacher for quite a while and people love it. You know, they love going to her classes. She's compassionate, she's caring, and that comes across. 
we also do a lot of professional training. So we did a training with um, the Dementia Alliance. Um, we were working with the University of New England and we had many, you know, we have a lot of older adults and the group that taught us, taught the, our entire staff were on little things. Like what was the color of your background? You know, was your video on? What colors were you wearing? Was the font in the handouts, was it big enough for people to learn? And our staff, after they attended that session, immediately changed how they were teaching. They listened. Um, and so that I think is important for us as an organization to make sure we're meeting people where they're at. Um, we just had a, a discussion with the Maine Immigration Rights Commission we are, we'll, we'll work with them on, on, and they'll provide translators and translate materials because we want to make sure that we're reaching all Mainers and no one is left behind. And so I think having that um, sort of that eye on that, are we meeting people where they are? And if we're not, we need to, we need to figure it out. We need to change our direction. So, um, so thanks, um, Jeannie, for that, um, for those wonderful comments. And I will make sure that our staff know, um, uh, um, we'll pass them along to our staff. Susan, are you able to provide the data that you shared about the towns? Uh, the ones that is in the PowerPoint presentation? Yeah, the ones that you've downloaded. And where it comes from? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can do that. It's it's coming out of the American Community Survey data. I think, and maybe Sarah, <clears throat> correct me if I'm wrong. I, were you looking to get a copy of the slide deck? No, I was just getting a link to the to the American Survey data. I was I unclear see. about okay. where it was coming from. I want to see how deep it goes. That's yeah, so so we purchase we purchased the data so that we have it in um, in in we don't have to do as much searching and poking around on site as you're probably aware, right? So we yeah. purchase the data, but it is all coming from American Community Survey data. Um, and those additional questions, those broadband survey questions are also, it's a different data set. So there's actually two data sets that it's coming from. Oh, okay. And is it, it, is it possible to um, get access through the Equity Center, um, Susan, by town for added town information, or is that uh, is that something I can just go on and do my deal? You certainly can do it, and okay, and, you, and you'll see some of the newer data that's going to be that's going to come up from 2020 data, right. which is going to you know there'll be some change. I'm not expecting a huge. It's typically not a huge. Um, change in numbers from 2018 to 2020, but we might be surprised when we see Yeah. That. Okay, yeah. great. Thanks. Yeah. And especially think about that too, 2018 to 2020 included the pandemic. So it's going to be interesting to see the variation of the data from then versus now. Um, and, you know, the increase in use, the increase in broadband connection, the increase in computers. Debbie has a question about the town of Charlotte. Has there been any contact with folks from Charlotte to try to facilitate community meetings? I've not heard from anyone from Charlotte. Okay, and they could reach out to you? Yep, we'd love to, we'd love to chat with them. Great, and Sandy. Hi, uh, just tagging off of the data sets that you have, Susan. And earlier you mentioned the seasonality of things. So broadband surveys are being conducted without the seasonality input in a lot of cases. So how is that impacting the communities in their digital equity? What impact does that have? So it's a great question. So you know, you've, you're all aware, I'm sure, of the speedtest.org, right? And so we get data from FCC, that's not great pretty bad actually, if I really want to be honest about it. So doing those speed tests in a community matters, that includes those seasonal homes, right? We see an uptick in um, students who join classes during those summer months that are likely, you know, they're giving us their main address, but I suspect that they probably are seasonal. We haven't asked that question. Um, but I think that, but we can see it in the numbers, you know, especially along those coastal communities where you have a, a you know, sort of a, 
you know, in Jones for it, you know, there's, there's this, it, there's an influx of people who come in. It's not huge, but it, but it's, it's definitely, it's definitely there. Um, I think that, you know, it's, a, it's the strategy from those local communities. Do you, do you have meetings that include the, their seasonal people during the height of the season, or do you wait till everybody goes home and you have them? And it depends on the community, right? Because everybody sort of approaches it a little bit different. Um, but I think, you know, I think that seasonal people can be really supportive and can, you know, that they want to help that local community. And, you know, we've seen that with a lot of the island and the, um, the coastal communities. I, you, know, you heard from Krista last week, you know, she's seeing that all the time. Seasonal, there are seasonal homes, people stay in their homes longer. You know, there, during the pandemic, people came from outside of Maine to come stay here at their seasonal homes as long as they had a good broadband connection. Um, I have a friend who works for the New York Public Library. He rents a house in Northeast Harbor every single year for two or three weeks. And pandemic hit, he came and he stayed here for two years, right? He has a good broadband connection. He could work for the New York Public Library from Northeast Harbor. It's a beautiful thing, right? We've seen, talk to Kevin Ray in Eastport about the uptick in homes that have been, that have sold in Washington County, it's an incredible a number. We now have a housing shortage in, in our county. Whoever would have thought that? I have a friend from England who is um, looking for a house in Jonesport, none to be found, right? And so we have quality of place and we have to capitalize on that. And broadband matters in quality of place because people can stay longer and longer and longer. You know. I, I think in my early days at Axiom, we always saw an uptick during the summer months and then Labor Day would come and they would, you know, people would suspend service. And then it was October, then it was Columbus Day, and then it was Veterans Day, and then it was Thanksgiving. People stayed longer with a broadband connection. So it's from it, I think it on the economic economics of broadband, you have to consider that um, in our in our um, in our county for sure. Just uh, following up on that just a little bit, Susan, last week during Krista's uh, Broadband 101 session, I had mentioned about um, in Eastport, people are staying, because that's where I live, um, but uh, people are staying longer and longer there as well. They can work remotely. They have, uh, if they have decent broadband access. Um, and so we have our neighbors are from Texas and they stay about 10 months a year now. <laughs> They're in Eastport about that. They don't want to. They don't want to see January and February, but they'll be back next month. <laughs> they just they can't do that. They go back to Texas and say back with that. But it also um, you you can attract a huge tele uh, telecommuting uh, population, and you know, like you, we've got quality of place. Uh, we mm -hmm. do, and and this was kind of discussed last week as well. Uh, broadband is extremely important, uh, and it's a huge part of quality of place, aside from the natural beauty and natural resources that. Absolutely. You know, well, East, in, in Eastport started its campaign, Elaine, when you were city manager, right? Of you, you can you can do remote work from Eastport, Maine, and you can come and live here. And you know, and and you know, I mean, broadband was okay, not you know, not not fiber, right? But it was enough to get people to be attracted to the area. It was a great strategic move on Eastport's part to set them apart. From everybody else who's on this call in the communities that they're representing, right? They were they decided to go the remote route, and you know you you got some traction on that. Sorry, I just uh, someone just direct messaged me. So, uh, uh, yeah, okay. Did anybody have any other questions for Susan? Any comments? All right. Well, in that case, I would say that um, we can, uh, first of all, I want to thank you all very, very much for attending. And Susan, thank you so much for your time. As always, just an amazing presentation. Um, I want to remind everybody that uh, we will be posting to the website um, all of the information, Susan's slide deck, and the, um, the, the, the free course catalogs and, and everything else will all be posted to the website, as will the recording uh, of today's session. 
And um, then I think, uh, Crystal, you also emailed all the participants as well, if I remember correctly. Yes, I did. And I can do that again. I just uh, put the website link in the chat for where everything will be located. Fantastic. Thank you, Crystal. So when you go to click on that link, you'll notice, oops, I think somebody got bumped out. Uh, just let them back in. So, um, but you'll notice uh, when you went to register for these uh, broadband sessions that the link said register for this session on this date. Now that's been replaced by view that session or, you know, to listen or watch the recordings and, and to um, view the slide decks or the, the PowerPoint slides. So it's, it's just back where you were, just instead of saying register, Crystal changed it over. So now it says to view, uh, to view the materials. So I hope to see everyone next week because next week is a big deal, isn't it, Crystal? <laughs> Yes, it is. <laughs> it is. Because this is where it is we're kind of going for here. We are moving on to community engagement, which is a very big deal. And already some of you are talking about this, like Debbie from Charlotte, you know, looking for some, um, and uh, Sarah and others, or Sandra or others are saying, you know, how do we kind of get people motivated on this? So next week, um, community engagement. And then after that, we're going to take a break from sessions for a little while so you can uh, put into practice all the good stuff you've learned so far. So, all right. Thank you all so very, very much. Thanks, Thank everyone. You Thanks, Susan. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you so much. Yeah. Stay Thank you, warm, everyone. Susan. Appreciate it. <laughs>